SpaceX's first major move after the B-18 disaster just shocked everyone. Booster 19's final section arrived at Mega Bay on December 20th, just 25 days after the first section left production on November 25th. Compare that to B-18, which took 136 days for the same process. What did SpaceX change to achieve this 3.5 times speed increase? And while they're accelerating toward Flight 12, ULA just lost Tori Bruno after 12 years as CEO. Two rockets also failed within 24 hours. Could this be SpaceX's biggest competitive advantage yet? Let's dive right in. Let's talk about what just happened at Starbase, because the numbers tell a story that's bigger than most people realize. December 20th marked a turning point, when Booster 19's final section, the methane tank connection piece between the hot staging ring and the main body, rolled into Mega Bay. It completed a journey that started just 25 days earlier, on November 25th. Now here's where it gets interesting. That same process for Booster 18 took 136 days. We're not talking about a minor improvement here. SpaceX didn't just get faster. They achieved a 3.5 times acceleration in booster assembly. After losing 18 billion in a massive fireball, how does a company not only recover, but dramatically outperform their previous pace? The answer reveals something critical about SpaceX's operating model. Most aerospace companies would spend months conducting failure reviews, implementing new procedures, adding oversight layers. SpaceX did something different. They identified the root cause, fixed the specific issue, and simultaneously optimized their entire production workflow. The B-18 incident didn't slow them down. It became a catalyst for process refinement. This is what separates SpaceX from traditional aerospace. They treat failures as data points, not disasters. Based on current momentum, B-19 should be ready for cryogenic testing in early January, followed by static fire testing around mid-January. If everything stays on track, Flight 12 could happen in late January or early February. That's nearly identical to the original B-18 timeline, despite everything that happened. Think about that for a second. They absorbed a complete vehicle loss and are back on schedule as if nothing happened. But here's what most coverage is missing. The speed isn't reckless. S-39 tells us exactly how careful SpaceX is being right now. A few days ago, road closures were announced between the production site and Massey. Everyone expected S-39 to roll out immediately. Didn't happen. S-39 completed full stacking weeks ago, yet it's still sitting at the production facility. Why? Because SpaceX learned from B-18 and S-36. They're conducting additional monitoring, running extra inspections, possibly making modifications we can't see from the outside. Nobody wants another incident, and the extended timeline for S-39 proves SpaceX isn't cutting corners despite the aggressive B-19 pace. There's also a physical reason S-39 can't move yet. The Massey test platform is undergoing major upgrades, and this is where things get really interesting for anyone following Starship's evolution. After installing the SQD system, the super quick disconnect, SpaceX decided the platform needed even more capability. They're adding a completely new static fire mount system. This isn't improvised. Chrome Kiwi's 3D renders from months ago showed exactly this configuration, suggesting SpaceX has been planning this upgrade for a while. On December 19th, the first frame went vertical on Massey. By December 22nd, a second frame was installed. But these are just the skeletal structure. The main functional component, a large sail-like structure that recently arrived by tow truck, hasn't been integrated yet. What we're watching is SpaceX building infrastructure for something beyond current testing requirements. This level of platform reinforcement for a ship test stand raises an obvious question. What are they preparing to test that current infrastructure can't handle? The most likely answer is V3 ships with significantly more powerful engine configurations. Starship V3 won't just be incrementally better, it represents a fundamental capability leap. And SpaceX is building the test infrastructure now, months before V3 hardware arrives. If this work wraps up in the next few days, S-39 could still roll out and begin cryo-testing before year-end. That would set up an aggressive early 2026 testing campaign, potentially clearing the path for Flight 12 by late January. Meanwhile, the launch site itself is getting similar attention. 
After extensive water deluge system testing, SpaceX is now focusing on a new actuator system for the chopsticks. This upgrade improves opening and closing speed, provides smoother motion control, and most importantly, better integrates with future lift and launch vehicles. Translation, they're preparing the catch system for Starship V3's larger, heavier configuration. Every upgrade happening right now, Massey platform, chopsticks actuators, the rising gigabay structure, points toward the same conclusion. SpaceX isn't just preparing for Flight 12, they're preparing for the V3 era. Gigabay's construction pace tells its own story. The crane's cable tower keeps getting taller as modules are added, allowing higher altitude operations as the structure grows. Current progress suggests Gigabay will be operational by mid-2026, perfectly timed to support higher production rates and more advanced vehicle configurations. This is SpaceX racing against time, not just toward the first V3 flight, but toward volume production of V3 vehicles. Now contrast this momentum with what happened on the same day across the industry. Tori Bruno resigned as ULA CEO after nearly 12 years. The announcement came without warning. No prior indication, no transition period mention. In a brief message on X, Bruno thanked the team and said ULA is in a great position to do important things. Lockheed Martin's statement was equally brief, but included one telling phrase. Bruno is departing for a new opportunity. He's not retiring. He's going somewhere else, though where remains unannounced. For now, COO John Elbin becomes interim CEO while they search for a permanent replacement. And here's what makes this resignation so significant. It comes at possibly the worst time for ULA. Bruno took over in 2014 when ULA's dominance in national security launches was just beginning to crack. SpaceX had started winning military contracts and the entire competitive landscape was shifting. Under Bruno's leadership, ULA developed Vulcan Centaur to replace the aging Atlas Vi and retired Delta IV Heavy. But look at the results. Since early 2024, Vulcan has launched only three times. The company is planning just six missions this year. Bruno had previously projected 20 to 25 launches for next year, but with his sudden departure, that target looks increasingly unrealistic. The fundamental problems haven't changed. ULA doesn't build its own engines. They depend on Blue Origin's BE-4. That creates scheduling dependency and limits flexibility. More critically, ULA's rockets remain fully expendable in an industry where reusability is becoming table stakes. SpaceX is catching boosters with chopsticks. ULA is throwing away entire rockets. The competitive gap isn't narrowing, it's widening. There have been persistent rumors about ULA being an acquisition target, with Blue Origin and Sierra Space mentioned as potential buyers. Nothing has materialized, but those rumors reflect the pressure ULA faces. Bruno's departure during this vulnerable period adds uncertainty at exactly the wrong moment. The question isn't whether ULA can survive, it's whether they can compete. And then, as if to underscore how unforgiving spaceflight remains, two rockets failed within 24 hours. On December 21st, Japan's H-3 rocket launched from Tanegashima, carrying the Michibiki-5 navigation satellite. The first stage worked perfectly, but during second stage flight, the LE-5B3 engine failed to reignite and shut down early. The satellite never reached orbit. Mission failure. This is H-3's second failure after five consecutive successes. All future H-3 launches are now on hold while JAXA investigates. For a rocket that was finally building reliability, this is a devastating setback. Less than a day later, South Korea's InnoSpace attempted the first orbital launch of their Hanbit nano rocket from Brazil's Alcantara Space Center. 30 seconds after liftoff, the vehicle exploded. Early analysis points to vibrations causing a fuel leak, leading to rapid combustion and vehicle loss. Five small satellites that were supposed to reach orbit never made it past the first minute of flight. These failures matter because they show what SpaceX is competing against and what makes their current pace so remarkable. While SpaceX is assembling boosters in 25 days and preparing for their next flight, established space agencies are grounding fleets after failures, and startups are watching debut launches end in explosions. The gap between SpaceX and the rest of the industry isn't just about technology, it's about operational tempo, 
failure recovery, and the ability to maintain aggressive schedules even after setbacks. SpaceX lost B-18 in a fireball. Three weeks later, they're ahead of schedule. ULA lost their CEO. Japan and South Korea lost rockets. The competitive dynamics couldn't be clearer. So what does all of this tell us about where the space industry is heading? SpaceX turned a disaster into a 3.5 times production speed increase in less than a month. ULA lost its longtime CEO with no clear succession plan. Japan grounded its H-3 fleet. South Korea watched its first orbital attempt explode. These aren't isolated incidents. They're symptoms of a widening competitive gap. While others are slowing down, SpaceX is accelerating. While others are restructuring, SpaceX is building Gigabay and upgrading test platforms for vehicles that don't even exist yet. The most telling detail? SpaceX is already preparing infrastructure for Starship I-3 while still testing V-2. That's not confidence, that's certainty. They know where this program is going and they're building the factory, test stands and launch systems to get there faster than anyone thought possible. We're watching the space industry split into two categories, SpaceX and everyone else trying to keep up. The gap isn't closing. After today's news, it just got wider. What do you think? Can ULA recover from this leadership change? Or is this the beginning of the end? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. If you found this analysis valuable, hit that like button and subscribe to Space Update 24 hours so you don't miss what happens next. Because with SpaceX moving this fast, next week's developments might be even bigger. Thanks for watching and keep looking up. SpaceX just launched 170 times in a single year. That's twice every week, controlling 55% of all rockets leaving Earth. ULA's CEO of 12 years just resigned. Why did the company that once owned government launches lose its leader now? SpaceX reuses the same booster 25 times while ULA throws theirs away after one flight. Can you really compete when your rival launches twice a week and you're still building new rockets for every mission? Let's dive right in. ULA didn't collapse overnight. For years after SpaceX emerged, ULA executives dismissed the threat. They had Atlas V and Delta IV, rockets that never failed when it mattered. Launches cost over $150 million, sometimes pushing $200 million. But the Pentagon paid without question. Why? Because when you're launching a $2 billion spy satellite, reliability isn't negotiable. But that confidence created blindness. While ULA celebrated their perfect record, they missed the bigger shift happening underneath them. SpaceX wasn't just building cheaper rockets, they were rewriting the entire 